Last century was the century of the generals. General Motors, General Dynamics, General Mills, General, who did I forget, Electric. It's the century of the generals, mass production, top down. That was so last century. Welcome to a different century. The first half, at least, of this century is organized around a collective, communities, creativity, sharing. Sharing is at the core of everything that we're gonna see in the next, let's say, 40 years. We're in the beginning of something really fundamental, but sharing isn't new to us. We've shared infrastructure, transportation, art, and public parks. We've shared restaurants, cafes, definitely pubs. And all sharing starts and ends with the mother of all share platforms. <laughs> but what's different this time is this. We're at this intersection where last century, so much of what we did and thought about in our personal lives, in our business, in our communities, was organized around ownership. This century, we're organized around access. We're at a moment in time where access to goods, services, and especially talent will triumph over the ownership of it. You might ask, why is this happening now? I certainly did. Well, there's a few uh, key things, four in fact. One, population. So in 1900, 10% of the world's population lived in cities. It might have looked something like this. Recent forecasts in the last three years are predicting that there'll be 9.3 billion people on the planet. 75% of those people are expected to live in urban environments by mid-century. So it might look something like this. Certainly, we can't have the same people and the same amount of stuff in the same physical space. And so something very different is happening. In fact, in 2010, for the first time in history, more people live in urban environments than, than they do in rural environments around the world. The second thing, besides population, is the recession. The recession in 2008 caused us to put the brakes on our spending. Many of us in our homes and our businesses have realigned the relationship between the true cost and the true value of things. And third, Last century, big brands were all the rage. We navigated around big brands. As an entrepreneur, it was a pain in the ass be because you had to convince people that your new brand or your new idea was worth trying. Really challenging. But so many of the big brands were caught with their hand in their cookie jar. They basically trained us to distrust them. And they're working hard now to come back. And lastly, we are more connected to more people on the planet today than ever before, usually unless you're standing next to them. But you'll see <laughs> that we're all running around with these little mobile devices that have cameras on them and they have GPS and they're web enabled. They're kind of remote controls for moving around the planet. And they're, they're actually a setup for reducing the friction for sharing. We're at a point where it's now more convenient and often less costly and more compelling to share rather than to own. An example, hotels. I'm guessing everyone here has stayed at a hotel and we all know that hotels are shared. It's designed that way. In fact, all of us know not to sit on the bedspread because <laughs> it's shared, especially naked. Okay, so that's the, the deal. We know that, we know that it's a setup. You know, we understand the phenomenon. Nobody is really super surprised. But now, this might really surprise you, if I asked you, what do you think is the fastest growing part of the travel segment? Private homes. Mar marketplaces like this one, Airbnb, many of you may be familiar with Airbnb, there are other ones like VRBO and Home Away and Love Home Swap and One Fine Stay and they have all these great names. Um, essentially, they're very simple. They're a two-sided marketplace, where on one side you have people who own or rent homes, and on the other side you have people who want to rent, to want to stay in their home as a guest. And so essentially, you have people, instead of uh, cities basically only having people uh, be able to stay in a commercial 
based, uh, what I would call sort of the commercial sector where the hotels are typically, now we have this whole different inventory and people are staying in Airbnbs and similar, through similar platforms, staying in private homes for a couple of days or a week, so a short stay. This is an incredible thing because in the last few years, Airbnb is about a five-year-old company. They have reached over 200,000 listings in 30,000 cities around the world. The average host who makes their home available sometimes is making about $9,300 a year. Airbnb did a study just looking at San Francisco last year between the summer of 2011 and 2012. 54 million dollars came into the city of San Francisco because people used Airbnb and as a guest they stayed in the city. 70 percent of those people stayed outside of the traditional hotel area and so they're spreading the wealth and balancing it out throughout the city. It's really a terrific way to stimulate local economies. And it brings us to the core of what I think is the sharing economy which is so many things that we value our homes, our bikes, our cars, our factories, our intellectual property, our talent, when it's sitting around unused, it's wasted. And what, what this economy is about is tapping into that waste and converting it through access to make it into value. Another example that I thought apropos for this area, Sonoma and Napa, that's so beautiful, amazing properties, most of them privately owned. People come in here and they want to run festivals and parties and weddings. Well, with a platform like this, Field Lover, you could, if you own land, put your land up and offer it up to someone who wants to run a, a fabulous wedding. But I want to bring our attention back to cities because so much of what's happening around the world is taking place in cities. And cities can't use anymore the strategies that they had last century. We're seeing cities move to this whole other idea. They want to create partnerships, often with us, through being open. And the first thing that they're being open with is data. Data about transportation, about wages, health, sometimes crime. Um, transit data especially is popular. And all sorts of entrepreneurs, developers, uh, people in the community are partnering with cities to create really interesting services like this one. A C-click fix essentially takes advantage of the fact that we're running around with these little devices that have cameras on them. And so if you're walking down the street in your neighborhood and you see a sidewalk popped up because the roots are bursting or a traffic light that's not working, if you take a picture of it, it goes to C -click fi through C-click fix to the right person in the city and allows them to manage the report, keeps you in the loop, nobody gets screaming frustrated on the phone. Uh, the city saves a lot of money, and these sorts of platforms are moving rapidly around the world. Secondly, and something that I've been really excited about personally, um, is that communities, especially neighborhoods, are starting to curate what they want in the neighborhood, a farmer's market, a, a special cool cafe, or an artist collective. And in this case, um, we have uh, one of my favorites, this gentleman named Luke, who's for 20 years or more been an oyster farmer not far from here in West Marin, had a vision to start this uh, restaurant that he calls Saltwater. It's spectacular if you have a chance to go. Um, but when he came to the idea and started to really put some uh, flesh on the idea and flesh it out, what he realized is that he would either have to go beg at the bank or be beholden to a bunch of investors. And so instead what he did is, was he reached out to the community of people that he wanted or believed would benefit from his service. And so people supported by buying meals ahead of time or committing to parties before he launched. Sometimes he did gifts uh, like trades in kind for equipment. And so Saltwater opened, he owns it completely, super successful, but it's essentially crowd-funded, or in this case, community-funded, um, and a really interesting and different business model. There's a lot of platform services out there. Some of you may have heard of Kickstarter, uh, which, which helps uh, to launch sometimes art projects or civic projects. And then other ones in the UK, Space Hive, uh, one called Lucky Ant, Small Knot, all of these allow merchants in small neighborhoods or in little communities to come up with ideas and get them funded through these platforms. So they're really terrific. I hope you explore those. What the core of a lot of this is this cultivation of generosity. 
And um, there's plenty of examples, but some of these are, are um, just really so palpable. Some of you may be familiar with the term, term maker. A maker could be anyone who typically breaks things also, by the way, but could be somebody who builds a car or a, or a little stool or a, a robot or makes certain crafts, uh, is a chef. All of this is, is, falls into the maker category. The, ben, the general idea is that it's inspiring people to get dirty, to get their hands on things, and to start making stuff. The more generous part of the maker community is that anyone who's a maker is passionate, they're enthusiastic, and they want to share whatever they can with you, their spirit, their, their equipment, their experience. Um, the Maker Fair is something that happens once a year, actually in San Mateo, but is now spreading through the world because the maker community is fairly infectious. Another one is uh, We Share. It started in France, in Paris, actually. A, a create, they call themselves a creative, collaborative community. And basically, it's people who are entrepreneurs, instigators, uh, fellow instigators, um, could be chefs and citizens, designers, certainly, but people who really want to shape the world around them. And so they're out there uh, working together, thinking together, often in, in touch with the city and some of the big businesses because people are seeing that there's a major change taking place. And so communities like We Share are actively engaging with some of the big players to help them over the, this, this big shift. And then um, some of the generals have also made it. So General Electric, as an example, um, is very voraciously trying many experiments sharing, looking at ways to convert waste to real value. They just launched something, GE Garages, that's in its infancy, but the general idea is that um, they have factories and talent and materials in communities all over the world. And so by reaching out to those communities and finding out what they need, many times education and some space or support, um, GE is engaging in that way. So stay tuned because they're at the very beginning of this. And then a real favorite of mine, in 2009 in the UK, people when asked basically said that they were, they were most concerned that they really felt disconnected from their community, that they just didn't feel connected to people, especially at home. And so they launched something called the Big Lunch, it's a really simple idea. On a particularly nice day in the summer, everybody came out of their homes, set up a table in front of their house, made it bigger than they needed for their family, and invited their neighbors to sit down and have lunch. Simple, irresistible. The first year, they had a million people show up. Last year, this year rather, it coincided with the Jubilee for the, for the Queen's big birthday. So they played with the Jubilee weekend, and 8.5 million people around the UK came out, sat down, and had lunch together. People live for that. I mean, there are so many amazing stories. If you, we, if you have any interest, go explore the big lunch. It's, it's just a terrific little, little treasure chest of, of great ideas. And the other thing, like Maker Faire is, and like TEDx, actually, the big lunch is spreading, and so people are taking it into their local communities as well. So life is social, we know that. And here in Napa, we have um, a gift, many gifts, but one of them, besides the weather and the landscape, is that we had Copia, which was this celebration of food and wine and art. The building itself has been sitting essentially like waste for five or six years, but through a social experiment I, that, that I think I watched as a social experiment, some of the people like Mick from Zuzu and Inotri and Kitchen Door and Hog Island and various restaurateurs got together and basically figured out that they could create this wonderful hyper-local organic garden and grow their food for their restaurants and for us right around the corner, really saving the, the gardens. And so this is just a, a terrific example of a social solution right here in, in our town, but, but one that's really fabulous. We hope it stays. And then um, the tools library. The tools library, again, simple. Um, we, all run, we all have, at least I have in my house, a bunch of tools I don't even know how to use. A lot of people confess when asked that they did a renovation some years ago and are sitting with this huge library of tools they never use. 
Um, this is part of a public library system in Portland. In Santa Rosa, a guy just decided uh, to be an instigator and start his own tools library. Now there's more than 800 tools there. A great idea, very social. And then Jogobo, that's basically um, a platform to bring play together using technology to facilitate play. In this case, soccer, or since this is from Santiago de Chile, they basically would call it football, so they did an English translation all the way for us. Uh, but essentially, this is if you're looking to play to join a soccer game, you can use this, this uh, platform to find pals to hang around with and play, or if you want to organize a game, you can recruit people. So again, we're using uh, technology connects us, humanity unites us. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. As we're moving really fast and playing with all of these new ideas and learning, we're making mistakes. And um, I made a career out of making mistakes, and I call it leveraging scar tissue. Uh, I have lots of scar tissue. I try to share it liberally uh, because it's, it's a great way to get connected, but it's also a great way to not waste uh, for, for the next person. And so there's some really wonderful examples around the sharing economy. One is, um, this is a, a picture of a bicycle from Paris, uh, from a bike project that's a bike sharing project called Vilib. It launched in Lyon in 2005, in Paris in 07, and it was a huge, bold, really brave experiment uh, that the French did. Now, today, bike sharing is the fastest growing form of personal transportation on the planet. It's o in over 325 cities around the world, and nobody has had to repeat the experience of the of Vilib 1.0 because we've all had the benefit of learning together. So it's a really very uh, lovely gift and very generous from the French. I just want to say so much of what's happening is about us being connected together, learning, and uh, basically coming, coming together to create experiments, to play, to, um, to make mischief. And uh, I'm a big fan of just telling you for sure that uh, we're at the very beginning of what is a fundamental shift in our personal lives, in the way that we think about work, in the way we think about cities. And I'm inviting you and, in, in fact, really encouraging you, uh, imploring you to experiment, go play, try to blow some crap up and see what happens. Um, <laughs> Please instigate. I, if you need help instigating, I'm always available. And uh, one of my favorite sci-fi writers says, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Thank you very much.